Our scripture lesson today comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, and has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. This is the word of God for the people of God. Have you ever been called to the boss's office or to the principal's office or somebody who called you before you to come to the presence of someone with authority? Well, most of us probably have. I remember back in high school, I was sitting in class and a voice over the intercom goes, is Jesse Rogers there? And the teacher says, yeah. Send him to the office, please. Okay. Go on, Jesse. Now I'm walking down the hall thinking, okay, what did I get caught doing? Not that I never got did anything that would get caught, but what was going on? Why am I being called to the principal's office? I don't think I did anything that bad. Well, I get to the administration building, open the door to the office, and the secretary goes, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm Jesse Rogers. I got called in. Well, go right on in, which you know is a bad sign. They don't say, well, wait a moment. It says, go right on in. So I did. I opened up the door, and there's the principal at his desk. I opened up the door a little further, and there's my dad. And I opened the door a little further, and there's a policeman from Forest Acres sitting there. I'm thinking, I know I didn't do anything that bad. <laughs> and I walk in and shut the door and say, please sit down. Now, a little tiny backstory to this is when I was in high school, I did a paper route for a couple of apartment buildings. I'd grab a stack of papers at 5 in the morning throw, and put the ones for that apartment building in the elevator right up to the top open the door, hold it, grab the papers, and start walking down the hall, putting the papers down in front of everybody's door. They got one. Get back in, go down the next door and, until I got through all the buildings. Well, that morning, I noticed that one of the apartments, the door was kind of open. And I'm thinking, that's odd, but so. Uh, maybe they just forgot to lock it or something or some, you know, opened it. Back in the principal's office, the policeman started off by saying, did you see anything unusual in the apartments when you delivered the papers this morning? Well, there was this one apartment. The door was kind of open. He goes, did you see anybody around or see anything that looked weird? Uh, no, it's 5 in the morning. Nobody's out. <laughs> And the officer said, well, we were just trying to investigate because the person in that apartment was found dead this morning. And, you know, I'm like, I didn't do it. <laughs> I don't know who did, but it wasn't me. And the officer said, yeah, you didn't do anything wrong. We were just trying to do an investigation to see if you'd seen anything because we've got to try and find out what happened. Uh, you can go back to class now. 
and I walked up to him. I was like, Phew. boy, it wasn't me this time. But I'm sure you've all had that feeling of trepidation when you've been called to somebody's office and you walk in and you're just not sure what's going to happen, but you know you're in the presence of some authority. It might not be the principal and a parent and your dad, a, a policeman, but you're in the presence of some authority. Until you're told what's going on, there's a sense of dread that kind of hangs over it. Now, imagine being called before God, the God of all creation, the one before whom the mountains tremble. There are a couple of instances in the Bible where we can see what happens to those who call before God. The first is in Exodus, when the nation of Israel has finally reached Mount Sinai. And God has called the entire nation. And in Exodus 19, we read, starting in verse 10, And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not go up the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on him. Whether man or animal, he shall not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they go up to the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, Prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. Can you be, imagine being called before God and seeing that? Can you imagine the fear that filled the people of Israel to see something that awesome, to see something going on over which you absolutely have no control and could absolutely destroy you in just a moment? That was God that they were standing before with all the sense of dread and fear that they had. That's who's being called to approach God, knowing that He held their lives in His hand. There's another vision from Revelation, chapter 4, when John has been called to come before God. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders, they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, 
who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Can you imagine being the one called to that scene, called before God in a throne room like that? The thing is, every time you pray, that's where you're going. You're going before the throne of God in heaven. Now, neither one of those descriptions sounds especially safe. Standing before the God of all creation, it even sounds a little bit dangerous because you're putting your life in His hands knowing that He has the power of life and death over you. How do you do it? How do you approach God when you consider those descriptions of what it's like? Well, the Bible gives us some hints. In Ecclesiastes, we read, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. The first thing to do is recognize that that's God. He is so far above you that there is incomprehensible how much greater He is than you are. He is God. And you're just you. In Proverbs we read, Blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. See, you cannot come before God knowing who He is without having a great deal of respect and a great deal of humility because you can't be arrogant. You can't be cocky because that's God and you're just you. And you can't come before God without recognizing some things about yourself. In 2 Chronicles, we read about the king Josiah. He became the king of Judah at the age of eight. And he set about reforming the nation because it had fallen away from God, <coughs> worshiping pagan idols. And he set about destroying all those idols getting rid of all the false priests. The temple itself had fallen into disrepair. It was filled with garbage, with Asherah poles and totems and other things for false gods. And Josiah, at the age of 26, gave the order to clear the temple and get it ready for worship. In the process of clearing the temple, Hilkiah the priest found a scroll the book of the covenant of the Lord that is passed down through Moses. They took that to Josiah and read it to him. And when he read the covenant, he realized the, how far Judah had fallen, how far the nation had fallen, how far, far he had fallen into sin. He wept out loud, tore his clothes open, and fell down begging for mercy going, now what? Because we deserve all the penalties that are found in there. So he sent to a prophetess to inquire of the Lord. This was her response in 2 Chronicles 34. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive, and you humbled yourself before God when you heard what he spoke against this place and his people. 
and because you humbled yourself before me and tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. See, Josiah, the king of Judah, went before God with an understanding of the severity of his sin. And he recognized that any penalty God handed down, he was due. But because he recognized that, because he recognized his sinful nature, because he responded crying out as he did, mourning over his state, God heard him. And God had mercy on him and on the nation during the time of his kingship. But that's because Josiah, even though he was king, didn't think of himself more highly than the others. He placed himself in the same position as those around him. Jesus talked about that in Luke 18. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other the tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I've got. But that tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I'll tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, we're no better than anybody else. And you have to understand, it's not what you do that gains God's favor. Paul tells us in Romans about that. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. See, you can't do anything to gain favor with God that makes you worthy of approaching God. It takes faith. And that's what Paul is trying to get through to us in this passage, is the role of Christ. In verse 6, he tells us, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is for everybody. God is for everybody. And he wants everybody to understand that. And he brought Jesus Christ so that we could all be together as children of God. And that was what he always intended to do. In verse 10 and 11, his intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. God always intended for those who have faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us to overcome our sin, to cleanse us, to come together so that we could approach him. As Paul says, that we could approach him, approach God with freedom and confidence. So what does it take? It takes Jesus, of course. But how do we get to that point of confidence? How do we get to the place where we can say that we can approach God in confidence because of Jesus? Well, Peter 
in Acts chapter 2 when he first addressed the, the folks in the temple in Jerusalem and told them all about who Jesus was and what had happened to him and what their role was in it. And the people responded. They were first convicted of their sins. And they said, what can we do to gain salvation? They confessed to God their need for him. And they expressed a desire for repentance. And Peter responded, what can you do? Well, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And you will receive the promised Holy Spirit and eternal life. Now, all of that sounds fairly simple. It's easy to understand that we're sinners to be convicted of our sin. It can be fairly easy to confess to God our need for Him. Repentance, that willingness to change our lives, to become like Jesus, to become transformed. That's a little more difficult, but it can be done. To be baptized in Jesus' name, to start life all over again. That, too, is something that is not all that hard to do. The really hard thing in all this is what comes next. See, we're being constantly transformed into the likeness of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. But the hard thing for us to do is to recognize that we are living a new life. Our sins are gone. Our past is forgiven. And we're in a process of transformation where we're still going to screw up and sin. But even those sins are not held against us because of what Jesus did on the cross. And because we know that our sins are forgiven, because we know that through the blood of Christ we have been cleansed and made holy, because we know that we now are living a new life, we have been born again to a new life as children of God, we can have confidence to come before our Father in heaven know that we are freed from the power of sin and death in this world. That's where we get that confidence. We know that we are not the same. We have been changed. We have been transformed. And that makes approaching God possible. We can come before Him. Even though He might seem fearsome, even though you might be tempted to run away because of who he is, you have been changed. And he invites us to approach him. He invites us to draw near to him because he wants us there. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are cleansed of our sin that separates us from God, that kept us from approaching him. God has opened the door to his throne room for you. He's inviting you in. Be confident of the fact that you are different, that you are living a new life, that you have been cleansed and made holy. You have a new status before God. He's standing there. The door is open, inviting you. Come on in. Come on in. Amen.